The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. I don't suppose I'm alone in a fantasy I often have when I look at some paintings. A sleepy, quiet house among trees. A street that turns a corner behind the painted buildings. A dark, mysterious cave burnt like a smoking hole in the side of a bright, sun-drenched Arizona cliff. Well, uh, I could go on and on, but I won't. What all of them have in common is the tempting allure of dreaming that it might be possible to step into the frame and visit that house, round that corner, explore that cave. A tug so strong that it pulls you towards the canvas as though hypnotized. If you've ever had that feeling, or even if you haven't, this is what our story is all about. Watch that old man. He sits there. Like no one is there but him and that screwy painting. No, leave him alone. The, the guy could be deaf or, or, or a mute. A, a museum is a place for a lot of people. It's like an escape. Uh, I get ways from this one. I think he's got to be watched. There's something eating him about that painting. And it's our job to protect it. mystery drama, Portrait of a Killer, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Michael Wager. The Fresnick Museum is not one of the world's great art collections, but it is surely one of the most eclectic by which I mean the rich man who left it and his house to the city, was extremely choosy about what he liked or disliked. It contains a wide-ranging potpourri of special and disparate gems, from a Rubens to a Paul Clay, from ancient Byzantine through the most literal of English 19th century painting to the Impressionists, the Cubists, and even a smattering of pop art. And, uh, most important to us, the only museum in the world in which hangs a W.H. Haskell. And thereby hangs our tale. Are you worrying about that picture again, Charlie? Darn thing haunts me. You know what I mean? Why don't they hang it in a better light? Mm, it's just the right light for a chiaroscuro, Charlie. Yeah, what? Uh, Italian word. Huh. Here we go again. Just because your father was born in Florence, that makes you the big art expert. Car uh, kiss, uh, well, whatever you said. But what's the word in plain English? Well, there isn't any. A chiaroscuro means, uh, well, the arrangement or treatment of the light and dark parts in a work of art, whether color or black and white. Yeah, but this painting here ain't in black and white. No, it's a monochrome. A what? Well, like it's done in different tones of all one color, kind of green-like. Oh, yeah. Now that you mention it, that's what it is. All green and spooky and crawly like cheese mold. Ugh. Charlie, you don't like the picture. Why do you moon around over it all the time? It ain't me. It's him. Who? The little old guy who's been coming in the last couple of weeks. Just around this time, after you go off. And? And nothing. He sits on the bench there, leaning on a stick, and keeps staring, staring at this here picture. Like he was waiting for something to move or something. Well, I know. To move? What could move? There are no figures in it. What do I know what could move? Maybe he expects somebody to sneak around in all them trees. Oh, come on, Charlie. You, you know, you're letting the job get to you. Now, I, I get crazy notions sometimes, living here in the past, like it was with, with the dead... With the quiet and all, but, but I thought you being older, it, it wouldn't get to you. I guess I was wrong. Uh, that ain't the deal, Joe. I mean, anybody that gets tied up in something dead and gone at my age eh, gives me goosebumps. I don't figure to be around so long. You? <laughs> You'll bury your nephews and your cousins. Shh, shh, shh. 
What is it? Here he comes. Here who comes? The viewer. With the scarf and all. Let's make ourselves scarce. You'll see what I mean. Why do I come here? Because somewhere, sometime, a man named John Brown has to be remembered. If not for himself, at least for what he could give of himself. Who would have imagined out of all the seemingly total failure of my life this one last unexpected piece of immortality remains? And how bitter that it had to be this. The visual representation of everything that brought me disaster and tragedy. Just watch him. Charlie, I'm hired by the museum to watch a lot more than a sad gray old man who comes in for lunch and a, and a rest. Uh, look at him. He'll sit there and stare at that painting without moving from now till closing time. Oh, what is it that grabs him so? Well, why don't you ask him? You want to come with me for a minute? I'll show you why. Okay. Nice looking picture, huh? Well, it's one of my own favorites. It really seems to get to you, sir. Forget it, Charlie. Let's move. Yeah, just a second. Hey, you happen to know the artist or something? Come on, Charlie. Okay, okay. You see? It's like no one was there but him and that screwy picture. Don't bother him. The guy could be a deaf or a mute. A museum is a special place for lots of guys. It's, it's an escape. Deaf. Mute, how I wish I were and sightless. Or dead. Only I cannot die as long as any trace remains. And this is all that's left. Oh, my sweet God, have I not suffered enough. Can I not at last make the final sacrifice and atone for all my crimes? Is there no way back? Some hope to change the future? I am alone. Nobody watching me. Could I step into that frame and back into the past? Could I relive it again and somehow change the course of fate? How long will I hesitate to try? What am I waiting for? If it is to be any time, let it be now. Joe! What is it now, Charlie? The old guy, sitting on the bench, watching the picture. Ah, we're back at the picture again. He just suddenly disappeared. No, like his, his age, he probably has weak kidneys. No, I don't, I don't mean that. He just walked into the alcove toward the picture. And when I moved around so I could see into it, he was gone. As though he stepped into the frame and out of this world. Hey, look, Charlie, uh, are you all right? Oh, I'm all right, yeah. I know what I'm talking about. Now, come here. Look, Charlie, Don't I... Don't argue. Come here. Now, look. Look at the picture. Pictures an obsession with you. I, I look at it closely. Yeah, right there, on the path, moving up towards the front door. Charlie, I think you're flipping out. Now you know there are no figures in that painting. Just look. I'm looking. I don't see anything. It's a kiskator, whatever you call it. It's hard to see in the shadows and the same color and what light there is. But he, he's there, just the same creeping up towards the door. Who's there? The viewer. The old guy disappeared from the bench. Oh, you got to be crazy. There's nobody there. Oh, how could you see without your glasses? Put them on. There aren't enough crazies wander in here from the outside. i got to live with one on the inside. Uh, okay. So my glasses are on. Where is he? Uh, it took too long. Didn't you see? He just went around the corner of the building to the back. You are as nutty as a fruitcake. I didn't see that. Well, I wish I hadn't. You know what he was wearing? What? A tweed suit with knickers. 
and high shoes with a skip cap. I ain't seen an outfit like that since I was a boy myself, just before World War I. The Braxton House. That damn Braxton House. From the beginning, it, it both lured me and repelled me. Just the house itself. Long before I'd met and fallen in love with Polly and learned to hate Gilbert Fairley, the smooth, suave guardian her father appointed when he died. Gilbert Fairley. Surely one of the most ironic names for a man who was driven to win, but happiest when he could do it by cheating or hurting or destroying the loser. That summer of 1917, sneaking around the corner of that bewitching at Lonesome House. I was bound and determined he wouldn't get away with it with me. Charlie, I don't know if you're putting me on, but if you're not, I'm really going to start worrying about you. Joe, I swear. First off, I noticed the old man had disappeared from where you were sitting. And then, I seen the guy in the picture. Moving. Dressed just like I said. But... That wasn't what scared me so much. Mm -hmm. What was it? Right here on the path. You see where there's kind of a spot of moonlight or sunlight or whatever it is? Yeah. Right there. He stopped for a moment. And he sort of looked back over his shoulder. Just long enough so I could get a glimpse of his face. Right. Mm -hmm. And he looked like uh, Boris Karloff. Right? Uh, no. Mm -mm. But so help me, I know who he did look like. Or the way he could have looked back there around that time. Yeah, and now you're going to tell me it was your bench sitter, right? Your, what is it you call him, your viewer? That's just what I'm telling you. I lay a dollars to donuts that old bum used to visit or sneak into this house around 50 years ago when he was a young guy. So maybe he did. But what's it to you? What do you care? I don't know. I just sure give a hell of a lot to know what went on in that house that was strong enough to call a man back from today to walk through that frame to yesterday. So, what did we have? An elder citizen filling a job who is slipping into senility without realizing it, or a valid case of dreams come true, an old man who has come back from Lord knows what to moon over a picture that represents his youth and in some magical way has beckoned him back to it to change the course of events or only to relive them. I shall return shortly with Act Two. It is the year 1917. America was racked with the agonizing debate over whether or not America should enter the Great War, which was raging in Europe. But somehow, individuals continued to be as absorbed as ever in their own personal problems. For example, a young man with the undistinguished name of John Brown, an artist with limited prospects and even more limited funds, fell helplessly in love with a young heiress named Polly Braxton, and she with him. I mention this only because if, uh, if, I repeat, it were possible for someone to step back through a picture frame into the past, and that man happened to be John Brown, this is where he would have found himself. It was a long wait, as always, for Polly in the gazebo. But at last she came quickly and silently to my arms and back to my waiting heart. Oh, John, darling, forgive me for being so late. I, I couldn't get away from him tonight. It doesn't matter. Now you're here. I love you, Polly. And I love you. I don't understand why he's so dead set against you, knowing it's what I want. I'm an artist, which automatically means I have nothing. How could I support you? Who cares about money? 
I have plenty for both of us. Not till you're 21. Oh, I, I couldn't live off you anyway, Polly. Only till you're a successful artist. And everyone realizes how wonderful you are. Well, I'll tell you something. I don't say I'm going to be famous, but I think I found a sponsor. Who? Mrs. Chelton Fresnick. That ancient old grass widow? Oh, grass she might be. Ancient she isn't exactly. Why, Johnny Brown, I'm surprised at you, scarcely 22. She must be all of 30 and beyond. And everyone knows her husband was old enough to be her father and more when they married. All things considered, he ought to have been your guardian instead of... Instead of me, <gasps> Mr. Brown. Mr. Fairley. Gilbert, I, I didn't see you approaching. I made no effort to conceal my approach. I'm even carrying a torch, as you can see. I was not aware you had an appointment with Mr. Brown tonight. A clandestine appointment. I need no protection against Johnny. I hope you never have cause to regret those words. I intend to do all in my power to make sure you don't. Now, just a moment, Mr. Fairley. I will ask you not to meddle in family matters, Mr. Brown. I'll talk to you in a moment. Polly, take this torch. Mind your way along the path. I'm not leaving. You will do as I tell you, or I swear by heaven I will lock you in your room till your 21st birthday. The torch. It will light you back to the house. Do as he says. You're sure you want me to leave? Trust me, darling. I do. Good night. You are never going to see my ward again. I'm warning you, John Brown... I'm carrying a gun at this moment and consider you a trespasser. This time, I'll let you go. But if you ever show up at Braxton House again, I will shoot you on sight. I'm... I may show up with a gun myself. You won't get very far. From now on, I'm turning loose trained dogs who will tear any stranger within the property apart. I left quietly enough my tail between my legs, but not as far as Mr. Gilbert fairly thought I'd gone. By the front of the house, I doubled back to the trellis in the wisteria and was up on the porch roof in a moment, knocking at Polly's window gently. Shh. Shh. What is it? Polly, do you love me? You know I do. But what? Then, then let me in. We've, we've got to talk about our future. If we're ever going to have any. Hey, Joe. Not the W.H. Haskell again. Yeah, yeah. What is it this time? The guy that was sneaking up the path. Yeah. I just saw him climbing up on top of the porch. And one of the windows was lighted up there. Oh, come on, Charlie. Not only that, but... What happened? Nothing happened, isn't that it? The wind is closed. The light's out. It's just like it was before. Yeah, and just the way it's always been. Elope, Johnny? It's our only hope. I told you what he said. He'd, he'd shoot me or turn the dogs on me if I tried to come back and see you. But how... Well, how can we get married? I mean, without his consent. Cross the state line. And you're old enough in that state without consent. How would we get there? What would we live on? I, I have a sponsor, remember? I'm, I, I'm sure if I talk to her, she'll buy the rest of what I've got. She's all, already brought one of my paintings, and, and I have that saved up a whole hundred dollars. That would pay for the wedding and the trip and all. But couldn't Gilbert have the marriage annulled? Not if you... Well, I mean, not if... Oh. Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, darling. We'll do it. I'll meet you at, at Four Oaks on the way to church. I can borrow a model team. We can drive all that day and make it across the state line in time to be married. By the time Fairley gets back, finds you gone, traces you, if he can, everything will be... Well, I, I mean, it won't be till Monday morning, and by, by then I'm... Oh, stop stammering, darling. I want to belong to you. To be yours. And once I am, he'll just have to accept things as they are. Till Sunday. Till Sunday. You'll never regret it. You'll never regret it. If either of us 
could ever have dreamed. But at that moment, I was too concerned with another problem that lay ahead of me, which also concerned a woman. My sponsor, Marsha Fresnick. Why, Johnny Brown. Who would have expected you this late? And wasn't it clever of you to pick the maid's night out? Come in. I'm sorry to bother you, Mrs. Fresnick, but... Well, something has come up that I... All right, Johnny. But do we have to talk about it in the hall? Let's go inside and be comfortable. And does it have to be Mrs. Fresnick? Well, now, uh... Come on and sit beside me on the couch. Now, let's get that unhappy frown off our handsome face and tell Mama what the trouble is. Well, I... Well, you kind of like the sort of thing I do, don't you? Well, I, I don't know. You haven't exactly started doing it yet. I meant my painting. Oh, that. Well, well, I mean, you did say something about helping me. I, I, you did sort of promise to be my patron. You, you bought one picture from me. Yes, I did. And let's be fair to Chelton. He recognized your talent. For painting, that is. He thought you had quite a future. You don't? Well, I'm temporarily interested in the present. Well, so am I. Oh, I'm delighted to hear it. Do you want to tell me why? Mrs. I mean, Marcia. How'd you like to have all of me? Well, now, that's quite a proposition. Why this sudden um, capitulation, if that's the word? Well, because I need money. I... I... I paint because I want to, and everything I paint, I, I never want to let go, never want to sell, but it's... Well, just now I need money. Oh, is that all? But don't be silly. I have plenty for both of us, and you can still hang on to your precious canvases. Plenty? For both of us? I, I don't understand. Well, let's not talk about that in the living room. We could make it all much clearer upstairs. Upstairs? Hmm. Oh, now, look. Marsh, I don't... I don't need money. Well, gee, I wasn't suggesting that, Joseph, but what, what I need money for is to get married. Married? Well, I, I, I don't mean to you. I mean to Polly. Polly? Oh, you mean Polly Braxton. Gerald Fairley would never let you have her. He has his sights on her for himself. Mr. Fairley, he's... Old enough to be Now, her. let's not discuss who's old enough to be who's what. And I don't want to talk about that silly little baby like Polly. Let's just concentrate on us. Sure, but what... I... Through my husband's connections, I can arrange a one-man show for your paintings. But that will take time. In the meantime, there's you and me. I can't wait for a showing. I, I, I just like to be able to sell all I have to raise some cash. So you can try to marry Polly Braxton. Yes. You prefer her to me? Well, Marsh, it's, it's different with us. You're damn right it is. You don't mind letting yourself out, do you? Since in a larger sense, you already have. The first thing the following morning, I went straight to Mr. Fresnick's dealer who had handled the one sale I'd made. I laid my cards on the table about needing money. He said he couldn't handle what I want, but... He would refer me to the Koppelman Galleries. And that's all you have? Every canvas I've finished, Mr. Koppelman. Mm. Van Gogh or Renoir, you're not. Well, I wouldn't expect to be yet. Besides, they're not my style. My style is to buy what I can sell. So, buy? No. Handle you, show you, maybe. But, but right now I need cash. Hmm. I'll take it on consignment, the usual percentage agreement, and I'll push it all I can. But that isn't what I need. It's, it's... Don't, don't rush me. I didn't finish. With you, I'll make a special deal. An advance against future sales, 500, and... <laughs> I can see that's not enough. <laughs> yeah, I'll stretch a little. A thousand dollars cash, but that is as far as I can go. When could I have it? I have a wagon downstairs. You help me stack these canvases in it, and you'll get it right away. I didn't question anything for a moment. Things had gone even better than I could have hoped. Polly and I met that Sunday's plan, crossed the state line by mid-afternoon, and 
got Polly settled in the hotel. We registered as man and wife, which we were going to be as soon as I found the justice of the peace. Then came the first blow. John, where have you been? What took you so long? When do we get the license? Oh, honey, I... There's something I, wrong. What is it? We... Well, we can't get married yet. Oh, we, I knew it. God is punishing us. I knew it was too good to be true. We still have to wait two years until I'm... No, no, say, take it easy, darling. Not two years, just two days, 48 hours. Oh, is that all? Then everything's all right. Sure. Only... I know. This was to be our wedding night. We waited so long. Why does it have to be longer? I... Yes, it's just the way the rules are made. But we are going to be married in 48 hours. We are man and wife already in our hearts. Couldn't we bend those old rules just a bit? Do we have to wait any longer? What harm would it do? Well, I guess... I, I guess, considering how much... We both want each other. It wouldn't do any harm at all. I make no moral judgments. I only comment that twice recently, John Brown has made compromises with the two most important things in his life, his art and his love. For some men, in any day and age, this has afforded no problem. For John Brown, marked by fate, or if you wish to call it retribution, it pulled his whole existence down upon him like a falling house of cards, spelled his immediate failure and final doom. I shall return shortly with Act Three. morning, Polly and John woke up together. Man and wife, in every sense but the piece of paper that would make it legal. Two things happened that affected their future. The United States declared war on Germany, and Gilbert Fairley, not entirely by accident, discovered where his missing ward had disappeared to. Both of these events set a series of actions in motion which are to bring us back full circle through 50 years to the Fresnick Museum and the haunted painting. But let us leave the future for the future and stay for the present with the past. Are you awake, John? Yes, Polly. Uh, for a long time, I, I didn't want to wake you. Oh, good morning, Mr. Brown. Good morning, Mrs. Brown. Husband. Wife. Oh, I feel so wicked. <laughs> Me too. And in about 34 and a half hours, it can all be nice and legal. Well, don't sound so bored about it. Well, I'm not, but after all, it's only a matter of form now. You're not worried about making a dishonest woman of me? Well, why should I be? Since I have every intention of making you the other two. The other what? An honest woman. <laughs> we didn't know how short our happiness was to be. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Huh? Perhaps that's an apt quotation, but... I never thought Marcia would have felt that strongly. But... I guess she did. I'm sorry if I'm late for lunch, Marsha. So am I. But then that's a habit of yours. Don't be cross. I, I am going to be very cross with you for many reasons. You intend to marry Polly Braxton. Of course. If I don't, before she's 21, she could bounce me out and quite possibly will. Where is Polly now? Time to find out. That's why I was late for our meeting. Do you have any idea? I might. Well, it's damned important to me. Really? Why? 
Well, you know why I'm not in the best of shape should my guardianship be examined now. But within a couple of years, with Polly as my wife, I need have no worries. Well, I have a piece of information that's worth your whole empire. What do I get in exchange? What do you want? A continuance of our present relationship. Nobody pleases me quite like you. Granted. Your little pigeon has flown the coop to get married. You have about, let's see, a little over 24 hours to stop it. Would you like to know where to find her? Who, who is that, darling? I don't know. I'm, I'm terribly frightened. Try not to be. Go into the bathroom, darling. I'll, I'll, I'll answer it. Okay, 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 I'm co com coming. Oh, it's you. Where is she? Where's Polly? None of your damn business. She's... She's my wife now. Oh, no, she's not. I took care to check on that at the registrar's office before I came here. I'm going to have you up for statutory rape. And I have enough evidence on you to make it stick. No, please. I'll go in court and swear that... You could only hurt him. You're 19 and still my ward. And without a marriage license, you have still not reached the age of consent. Now, I'm giving you both one choice. Take it, or I'll shame you and Polly out of all society, and I'll ram you in jail for the best part of your life, Mr. John Brown. What's the choice? We have just gone to war. We'll need plenty of cannon fodder. I shall expect you, Mr. Brown, to report to the nearest recruiting station today, or at the latest, tomorrow. And Polly? I'm going to do something for Polly that you couldn't or wouldn't do. I'll make her my wife. And an honest woman. I won't go through all the pleading, the threats, the tears from Polly, and the vicious obstinacy of Gilbert... Today, it would seem senseless. In 1917, it was a different world. And I ended up with one of the first cadres to ship overseas to the mud and the trenches as a member of the American Expeditionary Force. I think I prayed that a bullet would find me and put me out of my misery. But with the perversity of fate, since I didn't care about living, I was one of those who came back. As our troop ship docked, it was delirium. Everyone in transports of happiness. There was none for me. Of all the letters I'd ever written, I'd never had one reply from Polly. I was surprised when Marsha met me at the dock. Surprised that she was there, but surprised more than anything at how she had aged. So good to see you home, Johnny O. Well, I should be glad to be back, or at least grateful. How's... Where's Polly? Well, as soon as you can break free, why don't we go somewhere and talk? Where, where are you taking me? Back home with me. Are you surprised to see a woman driving a car? Yes, not you, but well, in general, yes. Well, I learned while you boys were overseas. The women's auxiliary did what it could. I'm sure it did. What about Polly? Well, she married Gilbert, you know. From all my unanswered letters, I could have guessed. Right after I left? Oh, no. She waited as long as she could, but... You say your letters were unanswered? That's right. Oh, dear Lord, it's worse than I thought. What does that mean? Well, I, I guess she could never have received them, John. I don't think she would have married Gilbert if she had. I mean, if you told her that you still loved her. I did. Oh, what's the difference now? Well, I don't suppose anything's happened to my paintings. I mean, anything of interest, I mean. No. Did you do anything over there? You mean painting? Oh, good Lord, no. I hope you will again. Your painting of the old Braxton house is still in my ex-husband's collection. The others? Well, you'd, um... You'd have to ask Gilbert about those. Gilbert? It was a condition Polly made before she'd marry him. They were bought from a dealer named Coppelman and put in her name. You have quite a sum waiting for you in the bank, Johnny. I don't want it. I'd, I'd rather have my pictures. Well, 
They are yours now to claim. What? What do you mean? She left them to you in her will when she... What? When she... When she what, Marcia? Is Polly... Polly dead? Yes, Johnny. Polly is dead. How? How? She was... She was going to have a child, but she... Go on. She committed suicide. Hanged herself before the child was born. Why? Why? That's something else you'll have to ask Gilbert about. He said, and he, uh, he had a telegram to prove it, that you had been killed in action. We all thought you were dead. And suddenly it was all crystal clear. That cold fish carrying through his plots at no matter what cost. The child, mine and Polly's, not his. The intercepted letters broke her, thinking I no longer cared for her. And then, with that false telegram, the last frail hope crushed. And her ghastly escape from his cruelties and demands. Taking our child with her. And so half insane with rage, I went to Braxton House for the last time to face the man I felt could shame the devil. I heard you were back in the States, John Brown. I've been rather expecting you to turn up here. Aren't you afraid? Of what? That you tear me limb from limb? I prepared for that. A German Luger. Yes. I purchased it from one of our brave Yankee Doodle boys like you. You are a fool. I'm not afraid to die. <laughs> My dear Johnny, I have no intention of shooting you. I have better ways of bleeding you slowly to death, making you writhe helplessly as I have this past year. Come with me. And let me give Polly's legacy to you. I followed him from the hall up the stairs to an unused room. We entered and I looked about the room in blank horror and blinding anger. Every canvas, save one that I had ever painted, blotted and drenched with bright red paint and ripped to tatters by knife slashes in their frames. The rest of your children. You must be mad. They're destroyed, ruined. How could you? My revenge for my humiliation. And now the last... I saved this one letter that I intercepted for you. Read it. I read it all. But the sentences that remain in my mind were these. You must understand, my darling, that I only married him to save you. And he will never touch me. Our child is growing inside me. And when you come back... We will arrange a divorce or an annulment so that we can be married. Please be careful. You must come back. I love you forever now. And if God should only allow that, in the beyond. And suddenly, I went berserk. You bloody murderer! You killed her! Remember, I'm armed. You think that will hold me back? Damn you! <laughs> you... You shot me! A lot of us brought Lugers home with us. Uh, I had mine and its bullet is in your gut. Get a doctor, get a doctor. I'm dying. It'll take a long time, though. And it will hurt. Maybe hurt enough to make up for what you did to Polly. And just to make sure, I am going to make an end of this charnel house. I am going to burn it to the ground. It can be your funeral pyre. The police found me at Marsha's. I was arrested, tried, and convicted of arson and murder, and committed to an insane asylum for life where I stayed until I escaped one week ago. Hey, Joe. Joe, uh, come on. Don't argue. Now I can really show it to you. Show me what? There's a light. A bright orange-red light 
in that upper window. Oh, are we back at the W.H. Haskell again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not only that, the old bum, the visitor, he's back, sitting on the bench. Yeah, see? Yeah. Yeah, I see him all right, but... <gasps> Good Lord, you're right. Now, you see? Not only the upstairs window... Or the other one over there and downstairs. Yeah. Looks like the house is on fire. Oh, you damn fool. The whole picture's on fire. Uh, look, hold them till I can get an extinguisher. So, it is finally ended. The last of everything. Even W.H. Haskell. Funny. All those years ago as a boy to feel that no painter of note would be just plain Johnny Brown... W.H. Haskell sounded more like it. And in the end, even he had to go. No immortality for any of us. Johnny. Johnny. Polly. Hurry up, darling. We're waiting for you. We? Me. And your son. Your son. I... I'm coming. I'm coming. Time at last to put an end to tragedy and face a new beginning. Oh. Yeah, that does it. Oh. Uh, now that it'll help the painting much, it's destroyed. Oh, you were right about that old boy. He is a vandal. Well, I guess... Well, I guess he'll get what's coming to him. The cops are on their way. Eh, it's going to be a little late, Joe. What? The old fella here. He's gone. Dead? Yeah. Huh. I wonder what he had against that picture. I guess maybe we'll never know. You know something, Joe? I don't think I ever want to. Maybe it's changed my own fascination for the idea of walking through a picture frame, like Alice through the looking glass, just to find out what lay deep in the heart of the forest, or the cave, or the house with the blank windows that showed no life. It's none of my business, really. And maybe I wouldn't like what I found there. I'll be back shortly. If any of you should come across a painting by W.H. Haskell, grab it for what you can, if it can be authenticated. After the incident in the museum, the old story was raked up again. And regardless of what artistic ability Joe Brown had, anything from his hand is, if not priceless, at least tremendously price-worthy. In his own strange way, he did achieve a sort of immortality. Our cast included Michael Wager, Robert Dryden, Joan Lovejoy, Jada Rowland, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. You killed a cab driver named Joe Paulson. What, what are you saying? Why would I kill him? You took his cash plus the ring. How did I kill him? With a gun. That, that's impossible. You know me, Lieutenant Davis. I never worked with a gun. Until now. I don't even have a gun. Oh, yes, you do, Eddie. We found it in your apartment. A gun? But how... A thirty-two. The gun that killed Paulson. Yeah, but I, I, I don't remember. If you killed him when you were high, would you remember? Well, no. no. Well, that's it, Eddie. You got the ring and the gun. Now, do you want to make a statement? I don't remember killing him, Lieutenant, but... <laughs> if you've got all this evidence... I guess I did. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams...
The preceding program was broadcast with the permission of the Columbia Broadcasting System.